Hey guys, we're having a popcorn party. Cameron Green here with me. Cameron, hello, say hey. Hello. <laughs> we're having a popcorn party, eating our Dr. Pepper because we're from Texas. <laughs> and um, we're hanging out, kind of dinner and a movie style, to go back and watch the videos from our Wake Up Conference 2022. Our next conference, guys, our national conference, there'll be our third year of bringing the body of Christ together, government and ministry leaders across denominational lines, November 3rd and 4th in Allen, Texas at Cottonwood Creek Church. We're so thankful for uh, Pastor John Mark and Pastor Scott Sanford for having us there at the church. But this message we're about to hear, Cameron, was one of people's favorites. Will Ford... (laughs) Uh, an intercessor, um, a Bible teacher, used to work at Christ for the Nations, has an incredible ministry. And Matt Lockett, who is also an intercessor, a friend of his, started Bound for Life in Washington, D.C., the Justice House of Prayer in Washington, D.C. They've had an ongoing friendship. And God does something in their story (laughs) that I believe is a message for the church today. Would you not agree? Absolutely. I'm just literally so excited for you to see this. So let's get straight into this message. Um, you are going to be blown away by the story um, of the Dream King. It's off from their book, The yeah. Dream King, Will Ford and Matt Lockett. And we'll join you on the back end to discuss it. Welcome to the Conversations with Christians Engaged podcast. I'm your host, Bunny Pounds, the president of Christians Engaged. This ministry exists to awaken, motivate, educate, and empower ordinary believers in Jesus Christ to do three things. To pray for our elected officials and our nation regularly. To vote in every election to impact our culture and to engage in some form of civic education or involvement for the well-being of our nation. So thankful, Bunny, for what you do. A lot of people talk the talk, but you really walk the walk. I love it, love it. Love teaming up with you, Bunny. So excited about what you're doing and the people you're reaching. and And I will stand and lock arms with this woman of God, Bunny Pounds, any day of the week. Bunny, you are a new hero of mine. America is worth it. Now is the time. America needs your involvement. Please take our pledge to pray, vote, and engage. Join with a movement of other Christians that are doing these three simple things that can really impact this nation. Join us. Good evening, good evening. It's an honor to be with y'all tonight. My God, my name is Will Ford of the Will Ford Matt Lockett team. And it takes two of us to come after Raphael Cruz. My <laughs> sir, that was amazing. I love you and love everything you stand for this nation, my God. And so we're excited to be here with you tonight to share this amazing story of what God is doing to heal the racial divides in our nation. You know, we hear a lot about, what's that thing, critical race theory or whatever that says that all white people are perpetual racists and all black people are perpetual victims. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's a lie. Yeah, that's a lie. That's a lie. But also, I believe that there are people right now God is using right now, like us, that are going to bring... The redemptive storyline, what God is doing to heal every divide in our nation. That's what I want to share with you real quick. I want to start off by sharing this with you by showing you a little clip from the I Have a Dream speech. Y'all have that? Show this one minute clip from the I Have a Dream speech real quick. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream. Powerful, powerful speech, right? I love that speech, but y'all, did y'all know that that little phrase, I have a dream, did y'all know that phrase actually came out of a prayer meeting? That phrase was birthed out of a prayer meeting. Dr. King was in a church that had been burned down by the Ku Klux Klan, and a young lady was in that prayer meeting. She's 22 years old. Her name was Prathia Hall. Prathia, her daddy named after prayer. He was a powerful black preacher, and she was an amazing prayer warrior and speaker in her own right. But this day, they're in the middle of this rubble that hatred had created. 
And she starts praying, I have a dream. And she starts naming off her own list. Because they were taking Dr. King to the airport later on. And Dr. King said to her, young lady, that, that phrase you used was really, really powerful. You mind if I borrow that? Say, yes, sir, by all means. And so for over a year, listen, for over a year, Dr. King used the phrase, I have a dream, in his prayer meetings. It was part of his prayer life for over a whole year. Gets ready to preach about a month before the march in Washington. He's in Detroit, and he's working on his speech that he's going to do next month, working with speechwriters. He says the whole speech verbatim, but he gets to the end, and he starts declaring what he'd been praying for over a year. I have a dream. He starts naming off his own list. The speech writers told him to leave it out. They said, Doc, that, that stuff is too cliche. Leave it out. <laughs> but thankfully, his friend Mahalia Jackson was there in Detroit, and she said, Martin, you got to do that thing when you go to, when you go to Washington. So the next month, he's, he's in Washington, and if you get the right version of the I Have a Dream speech, he's reading it verbatim, and then he gets to the end, and you can hear somebody in the background say, Martin, tell him about the dream. That was Mahalia Jackson. And then he kicks in the I Have a Dream. <laughs> And the rest is history. All because he overheard somebody else in a prayer meeting. Question. What kind of impact is your prayer life having on the people around you? Not like you need to be praying with one eye open to see who's around. <laughs> but what I'm saying is there's something about Dr. King taking that girl's prayer because he heard it and then casting it as a vision for us all. There's something about God, what God is doing to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the children to the fathers is going to break a curse off this nation. And he's doing it through the place of prayer, right? Now, I'm going to share this story with you. And really, it's, this story is passed now because somebody overheard a prayer meeting where they used this kettle pot in my family. It's passed down for many generations, owned by the slaves in my family. And listen, it wasn't passed down as a form of victimization, it was passed down to be a sign of the victory that we have in Christ Jesus to tell us, look, this is how far we came by faith. Amen. So I hadn't thought much about this part until I heard this powerful story about the power of agreement in prayer. But the other thing about that, that conference where I heard this man, Dutch Sheets, talk about this, he said, not only can you agree in prayer with the person sitting next to you, you can also agree in prayer with a generation behind you. And the concept was is that there's a baton from prayer for prayer from the previous generation that God wants to release on this generation. In other words, he wants to raise up double portion sons and daughters in the place of prayer right now to change the course of history in our nation. So I'm one of those sons of former slaves. And I remember when I heard Dutch talk about that, I remember this kettle pot that's been in my family. Like I said, it was used by the slaves in my family. They used it for cooking, but secretly they used it for prayer because they were owned by a slave master who would beat them for any reason. Praying was one of them. But in spite of the danger and because of their love for Jesus, they would sneak away in a barn at night and pray anyway. So what they would do is they would go into the barn. Well, everyone was sleeping in the plantation. They would take this pot. This is the very pot that they use. And they would take the pot and they would turn it upside down on the cabin floor, as the story is told by my grandmother. They would prop it up with rocks on the edges so it would be suspended off the ground about an inch or two. They would then prostrate themselves on the ground and put their lips in between the opening between the ground and the kettle so that the kettle pop muffled their voices as they prayed through the night. And the story that was passed down with this pot is this, is that they didn't think they would see freedom in their time, so they prayed for the freedom of their children and the next generation. One day, freedom came. This young teenage girl, she decides to keep this pot and that story in her family. Why would she do that? Because she overheard somebody else praying for her. And she knew that she wasn't the only recipient of their sacrifice. So she passed this pot and this story down to Harriet Lockett. Harriet Lockett, her daughter, passed it on to Nora Lockett. Nora Lockett passed it on to William Ford Sr., who passed it on to William Ford Jr., who then gave it to me, William Ford III. And all of a sudden, while I'm there in that prayer meeting, I thought, oh my God, to whom much is given? Yeah, much is required. But beyond the obligation, I thought about the privilege. I thought, oh, oh, my God, I get to agree with the prayers of my forefathers for the freedom of this next generation. I thought about the exponential results that could be released and created from that. Shared it with the sheets. We became friends. And we started talking about doing a prayer journey around the country and using this kettle pot as an object lesson on prayer. Listen, they use this pot to muffle their voices. But listen, according to Revelation 5 and 8, there's a golden bowl in heaven full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And it's a golden bowl. You know why? Because that's how precious your prayers are to God. Listen, 
There's a prayer bowl over Texas. There's a prayer bowl over our nation. God's looking for a new generation to resource the prayer bowls once again. Because it wasn't just the prayers of black Christian slaves praying back then. Also the prayers of white Christian abolitionists and revivalists. They knew that if any person was a slave was a Christian, they knew that person was their brother. Listen, they laid their lives down for each other. Many of them had their houses burned. They were also shot, killed, and lynched because they chose to suffer with the people of God rather than compromise and wink at slavery. It was the prayers of that godly remnant that prayed into being the first and the second great awakening. Had it not been for those revivals, slavery would have never ended in our nation. So I'm daring to believe, listen, the same God that just broke the power, he he brought the power of Dred Scott back then, right? And he just brought the power of Roe v. Wade. (laughs) And he's going to put an end to systemic poverty. He's going to stop our schools from being a pipeline of the prison. He's going to shut down the opiate crisis in the suburbs. And he's going to shut down the crack houses in the inner city. He's just looking for a new generation of people who will drop their agendas, come together, and believe. Because the deal is this. When the people that we cannot see can become optional, talk about the child in the womb, when the people that we cannot see can become optional, it's inevitable that other people that we can see can also be dehumanized and marginalized even to the place of elimination. Some people say black lives matter. I get what they're trying to say. I can get with the emphasis, but not the entity. They spend too much money on houses. Some people say all lives matter. I know what they're trying to convey, but God is saying drill down deeper. Life matters. Amen. But the Lord spoke to me and said, if you want to be a part of this, you got to deal with your own baggage. So he addressed that through this dream that he gave me about the dream of Dr. King. In the dream, I'm on my way to Dr. King's church in in Alabama with my friend Lou Engle in the dream. And Dr. King came out of this house to get in this vehicle with us. So it's a dream, so he's alive. But he had this humongous white duffel bag with black handles on it. And in the dream, he starts emptying all this dark garbage out of that duffel bag. Then he throws it down violently and comes to get into this vehicle with us. In the dream, I thought to myself, man, that bag would make a nice souvenir. Shows you how petty I am, right? Like, even in my dreams, I'm thinking, I went to Morehouse College, he went to Morehouse College, the bag would make a nice souvenir. But in the dream, I go to try to pick up the baggage, but before I could touch it, Dr. King grabs me by my shoulders and he says, no, do not go back and pick that up. And in the dream, he starts telling me what I need to do to heal the racial divide in our nation. I woke up from the dream in tears. Shitter, my friend, Lou Engle, he begins to weep and pray, God, what is the interpretation for this dream? God, remind me. What did Dr. King say to me? The Lord said to me, William, the white bag with the black candles, that would be the interpretation for your dream. I realized the black candles represented my ethnicity as an African-American man. And the white bag has represented my unforgiveness issues with racism that I experienced growing up. God was saying to me, William, get rid of your white baggage. You've been carrying it for way too long. I know what he's talking about because I know that's like a 13 years old to be chased by a car full of white guys. Said, shouted the N-word at us. Said they were going to shoot and kill us. They're probably just joyriding, but listen, we were terrified. They chased us for almost two hours. I know what it's like to live in my first nice suburb, neighborhood, and have the same police officer every week for the first three months pull me over just for driving while black. I know what that feels like, but you know what I've done? For every police officer... And every white person in that community, I put those stories on everybody. I saw everyone through the veil of those experiences. So it's the devil's diabolical plot in this Revelation 12 where it says the devil is the accuser of the brethren. That word accuser, y'all, comes from the Greek word kategoros. It's where we get the word category. The diabolical plot of the enemy is just to categorize or stereotype each other. So that before we have one conversation with each other, we put some bad narrative, some bad storyline in each other. God was saying to me, William, get rid of your bitterness. Get rid of your resentment. Get rid of your unforgiveness. Get rid of your white baggage so you can get into a new vehicle that can bring revival and justice for everybody. And that's what God is shouting to all of us right now is this. What color is your baggage? Listen, church, get rid of it because we need each other. Because only a united church is going to heal a divided nation. Amen. So with that, my friend Lou Engle said, hey, come bring your, your, your pot and share your story. January 17, 2005 at the Lincoln Memorial. It'll be a powerful day. But little did I know, I would meet this guy from Colorado at the time. And it was my good friend, Matt Lockett. Matt, please come share. <laughs> good evening. What a privilege it is to be with you here tonight. And uh, we're just excited to be able to share this story with you, really what you're hearing tonight is an origin story. We all like a good origin story, don't we? And uh, think about it this way. 
I've, I've thought a lot about this. I've been involved with the pro-life movement for a long time, and, and I think it's boiled down to this, that at some point, God had a dream, and you are the manifestation of that dream. You are the embodiment of the dream of God. You, God didn't sneeze and you fell out in the timeline right now as some accident, right? No, God actually had a dream and you are the embodiment of that dream and you are now here for such a time as this. And so before anybody is tempted to get discouraged about this moment in time right now, remember you were made for this. You were fashioned for such a time as this. So what I would like to do is... Uh, kind of pick up right where Will left off, and I'm going to hopefully share with you how my story got woven together with Will's story. And he mentioned this specific day just a moment ago. It was January 17th, 2005. And I'm going to start there, but I'm going to back up exactly one year, actually one year to the day, January 17th, 2004. Uh, something really tragic happened in my life. My dad passed away unexpectedly. And so I'm sure many of you in this room have experience something like that. And something really profound happens when you lose your mom or your dad. And I, I just think that, you know, you've spent your whole life receiving from them. Maybe it was a grandparent, but, you know, hopefully they put a roof over your head and food on the table. But most importantly, they told you the stories, didn't they? They told you who you are and where you came from. And every family's got the good stories, the bad stories, and the ugly stories. We've all got that. But you receive from them. And then when you lose them, something really profound happens. What happens is you now, a mantle gets passed, you now become the steward of the storyline. And that's very important for you because as a Christian believer, we have a privilege of actually making sense out of the story. Because as Christian believers, even the bad parts we can find meaning from, even the, the ugly parts of the storyline, God can bring meaning and it helps shape our point of view. Amen? So... In my family, in my dad's family, we couldn't get past my dad's grandfather. And so it was after I lost my dad, it became very important to me to try to find something out about our family tree. Now, can I just ask for a quick show of hands? How many of you have looked into your genealogy? Okay, actually, I'll, several, I see several hands go up. Usually when I ask that question, just a couple of hands grow up, go up. And what that tells me is that we are actively losing our stories. We are in the process right now of forgetting what the unfinished business of yesterday is. We don't have any idea who we are for the most part. So I decided it was important that I find out where the Lockett family came from. And really, I didn't understand at the time, but what I was looking for is, God, is there any unfinished business in my family that I need to pick up now? Now, that's the understanding I have now. But at the time, I just wanted to find out where I came from. And so I began to to look into this. Now, this was a, a, a very difficult process in my family because we couldn't get past my dad's grandfather. But my dad is one of 16 siblings. Come on, mammal. <laughs> they don't make mammals like they used to. <laughs> but in my dad's family, no one had ever discovered where the lockets came from. In fact, by my dad's generation, we were just a bunch of mutts from Kentucky, is what my dad would say on a tobacco farm in Kentucky. And so I spent that year after he died looking and researching in my family tree. And you know what? I came up with nothing. I hit all the same roadblocks that anyone had ever hit that looked into this. And so I was finishing that year more frustrated than I started. And it was during that time that something really curious happened. I had a dream. Now, Will mentioned dreams a moment ago. And we're not talking about the Dr. King kind of dreams where it's like a vision for the future. I'm talking about the kind where you go to sleep at night and you feel like the God of the universe is speaking your language. Do we have anybody that has those kinds of dreams? Oh, this is a dangerous crowd. So I had a dream. And I won't tell you the dream because I don't have time, but I'll tell you what it was about. In the dream, God began to show to me his heart for the ending of abortion in America and how he was going to bring that about through day and night prayer. Now, there were three things about this dream that were strange to me, and I didn't understand. Number one, I didn't know at that time in my life, I didn't know anything about abortion. I'm embarrassed to say that. I've been a Christian since I was 15 years old. Uh, the second thing was I didn't really know anything about prayer, and I'm also embarrassed about that. But number three, there was a man in my dream, and his, I knew his name was Lou Engel. And I know some of you probably are familiar with who that is, but I didn't know who that was. But I dreamt about him. And so I had this dream, and, and I, it's almost like I had the dream, but the dream had me. You know, it got a hold of me. It wouldn't let me go. And so I found out there was a real guy named Lou Engel. 
He's really doing this thing with prayer. And I somehow got the phone number of somebody that worked with him. And I cold called him one day and I said, hey, I don't know you and you don't know me, but I had a dream. And he goes, really, what was your dream? I didn't expect him to take me seriously. This is weird stuff. Like we're, we're in strange territory now. So I told him my dream and he said, this is very interesting. You just dreamt exactly what God is sending us to do. We are going to Washington, D.C. to pray and contend for the ending of abortion in America. And then he said this, we're going to do a prayer gathering on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial on Martin Luther King Day. Maybe you should come to it. God might have something for you there. Now, this is weird, okay? Uh, You know, God, do you really want me to take time off work, spend hard-earned money to go all the way across the country? I lived in Colorado at the time. Go all the way across the country to go to a prayer meeting. And uh, God made it very clear that I had to go. And so I, I decided to go. I didn't know why I was there. I just kind of showed up. And I didn't understand why we had to pray outside. For eight hours in January. It was zero degrees that day. I have a picture of that prayer meeting I want to show you. If you could put up the first image for me, please. This is that prayer meeting. And so here we are. Of course, that's the Lincoln Memorial in the background. You'll recognize it. This is the spot where Dr. King gave the I Have a Dream speech. If you know who Lou Engle is, you might recognize him on the right side of the picture. But if you look on the left side and you see that arm that's extended out, that blue sleeve, and if you follow it all the way out to the end of the fingertips, you will recognize that is Will Ford. So the first place that Will and I ever came together was right there on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Isn't it interesting that I was there because I had a dream? And Will was there because he had a dream. All right, so we prayed that day, and that night there was a guest speaker. It was a guy named Will Ford, and uh, he brought out this kettle, and he told the story that he's just shared with you tonight. Now, it's exactly one year to the day since my dad died, so I'm like a raw nerve that night. I'm a mess, and uh, had been looking and searching and didn't really feel like I found anything. And then I'm listening to this story from this man and this story of a rich spiritual heritage of ancestors who had contended for the destiny of America. And I was really provoked by it. But then he shared this little detail that I wasn't prepared for. And he said that this kettle was handed down to Harriet Lockett, who gave it to Nora Lockett, to Wilford Sr., to Wilford Jr., to Wilford III, the man on the stage. I had my 10-year-old daughter with me at the time on this trip. And she turned to me and said, Daddy, he just said our name. I'm like, I know. And so after the meeting, I went up and we were, it was in a church. And so we were standing at the altar of this church and Will and I began to compare notes. He actually quizzed me that night. He's like, well, how did your locket spell their name with one T or two? And I said, two. And he said, well, our lockets only spelled it with one T. Where are your lockets from? And I said, well, I don't really know. My dad's from Kentucky. And he said, well, our lockets were all the way down in Louisiana. And we just thought it was this amazing coincidence. But you know what? It was enough that it connected Will and I in really a really powerful way. We became very close friends. God called me out of uh, my career in the marketplace. And as a result of this, I became a full-time missionary in Washington, D.C. You're welcome. And uh, our 18th anniversary is next week in two weeks. Yeah, two weeks. October 4th. We are 18 years old. That means we can vote and go to war. <laughs> so let me fast forward in the story a little bit. The, at the be- we, we have a house of prayer right on Capitol Hill. And God gave us a dream at the beginning of our house of prayer that really has defined a lot of how we've engaged uh, in, in this governmental sphere. And in the dream, we were in a huge building that was filled with courtrooms and we were being led from one courtroom to another. And in the, dr- the Lord spoke through the dream and he said, either you deal with Roe v. Wade in your courts or I will deal with it in mine. Now, that was a very serious statement because at the end of this long hall in the dream was a huge courtroom, and on the door it said Appomattox Courthouse. That's a historical place. If you don't know what that is, that's where the Civil War ended. That's where Lee surrendered to Grant. So we're wondering all these, you know, all this time, like, God, why are you taking historical language from a previous generation and dropping it into a dream for this generation? But you know what? pray your dreams. We began to pray, God, we don't want to have to go back to Appomattox. And so for the last 18 years, that's why we've been contending for the courts and for the ending of Roe v. Wade. Guys, (laughs) we've been doing this for years, looking to a moment when Roe v. Wade would be overturned. And now, tomorrow, we can say, 
Three months ago, Roe v. Wade was overturned. I, are, are we really truly celebrating this? Because I'm in my dream, a dream fulfilled. God showed me this 18 years ago this month. And he is, that dream has now come to pass. Anyway. So, fast forward again. Lou Engel was going to do one of his prayer gatherings in the state of Virginia. And he contacted me and he said, hey, if we're going to do this, first we have to go pray at Appomattox Courthouse, that historic site. So we went there. And uh, we prayed in the McLean farmhouse where Lee surrendered to Grant. Only this time we prayed that another unconditional surrender would come to America, this time to God. And as we were leaving, we went into the little visitor's center. And Lou and I were standing side by side at a bookcase. And he grabbed the first book off the shelf that caught his eye. It was this book right here. And it just fell open to a random page. And I want you to see the page. If you could put up that next image, please. It was this illustration called The Last Shot, The Battle of Lockett's Farm, spelled with two T's. And he asked me, what is this? I said, I don't know. So I bought it and I began to study it. What I found is that the last battle of the American Civil War occurred in the front yard of a family named Lockett, The Battle of Lockett's Farm. Now, would you agree that might mean something? So it was about this time that my older brother got the breakthrough on our family tree. And he called me and he's like, you're not going to believe this. I got us back to the year 1645. We came in as settlers through the colony of Virginia. And I said, Virginia, have I got a story for you? And I began to share with him about the end of the Civil War. And he stopped me and he said, wait, that's not that place by Appomattox Courthouse, is it? I said, yes, it is. Why? He said, oh, I just found the documents on it. That was our family. So what I'm telling you is that the last battle of the Civil War that ended slavery occurred in my family's front yard. Isn't it interesting that we've been praying that Appomattox dream for all those years? Well, I found the place. I want you to, if you could put up the next image, please. I want you to see it. This is the Lockett House. And so you don't think I'm exaggerating. There's the historical marker in the front yard that reads, here Lee fought his last battle. I went to the house and I met the man who lives there and he invited me and I was stunned when I Walked in and framed and hanging on the living room wall was the Lockett family tree. And I had my brother's research with me. It was a hand and a glove. This is my family. If you could hold off on that image, please. And so he began to ask me what I know, and I didn't know much. And he explained that some of the Lockett's went to Kentucky. Some of the Lockett's moved to the Deep South. Some were involved in historical events. But then he said this, some of the Lockett's left and went to Louisiana. And then he added, and in some cases, there was a clerical error on those handwritten census ledgers, and they accidentally dropped one of the T's and changed the spelling of the name. So I'm thinking what you're thinking right now, this cannot possibly be true. So Matt flies from D.C. to Dallas, lays out all this information, and we just honestly talked and prayed and cried. So my oldest known family member was believed to be a man named Isaac Lockett. And in that... 1870 census he's living in Lake Providence Louisiana where this kettle came from but in that census he said it was originally from Virginia you know slaves always stuck on the last names of people who owned them and sometimes they were willed off or went off with other family members across the country so this led to another year and a half of research and here's what Matt and I learned from the empirical evidence that we have it was my friend Matt Lockett's family who owned my family where the kettle pot came from this kettle pot came from. So think about it. Here's my family praying for the ending of slavery. But then all the way up at the farmhouse of the people who originally owned them, slavery comes to end in their front yard. But then because he's the God of the past and the future and he loves to heal history, God weaves two people from those same family lines together, Matt Lockett and I, weaves our storylines together so we can war against injustice in our day and cry for awakening in our time because that's the kind of God we serve. He loves to heal history. Napoleon. Sit down, because you, you're going to make my friend from New York really mad. <laughs> we won't hear my taxes in real sec, but just real quick, put up the next slide for me. This is Napoleon Lockett and Mary Lockett. This is how crazy the story is. These folks were the gone with the wind aristocrats, and uh, he owned lots and lots of slaves between he and his 11 children. They know hundreds of slaves, but his wife, she was a socialite, and she said, you know what? It's not, it's not right for the Confederate White House to have its own flag, so she designed the first ever Confederate flag hand sewed it in our house, hand delivered it to our friend Jefferson Davis. In other words, Matt's family is the Betsy Ross for the Confederacy. 
And so she came up with this flag. You go to the next slide. This is called the stars and the bars. But they thought that looks too much like the Union flag on the battlefield. So let's come up with a Confederate battle flag. And then they came up with this flag. But think about it. Through the same family where the flag of rebellion was raised up. Next slide. The flag of surrender goes up in their front yard because God heard praying people. Yep. So this is what you have to understand is that it, Will and I didn't find this story out the first night that we met. You know what would have happened if we found this out the first night? Um, we, we might have been nice to each other or pleasant, maybe even shaken hands, but then we would have socially distanced for the rest of our lives, hoping to never see that guy again, because this is painful. So think about this. Will and I didn't know any of this until after we had been praying together for about a decade. We've been running together, doing ministry together, just living lives close to one another. I love this man's family. He loves my family. I fight for his dreams. He fights for my dreams. I kind of think that's how this is supposed to work. Yes. But now think about it. For a decade, I've been listening to the story of the kettle, inspired by it. But now I found out suddenly that I'm connected specifically to this story. And I'm connected to the worst parts of the story. I'm connected to that of the slave owner. And I wish we had more time to talk about how God helped us in that moment, but I'm so thankful that he gave us the gift of relationship. Because see, we, we can't bear this. This is what's going on in America right now, is we're, we're trying to deal with historic wrongs, but we're doing it apart from relationship, and it will not work. And so I think what God is doing, what he has done with us, is just a little, it's a little snapshot, I think, of what God is wanting to do in this nation in terms of reconciliation and healing. But here's what's great. Once the lid came off the family tree, there was, it just seemed like a treasure trove. And so what we found out is, yes, we had slave owners in my family, but in the previous war, in the Revolutionary War, revival came to that same part of Virginia. And I was reading a historic book about that revival, and I turned the page and I learned that one of my ancestors, Daniel Lockett, became a Methodist circuit rider as a result of that revival. And what's powerful about the circuit riders, and I love the history of the Methodist church at that time in history, about 1779 when this happened, is that they were carrying the gospel to the frontier, but they also carried a thing called a manumission form, which was a legal document that allowed you to set your slaves free. Yes. Everywhere the circuit riders went, the population of freed slaves exploded because that's the power of the gospel that you're carrying right now, not just to change your own heart, but to literally to reshape the world around you and bring reformation. Amen. So I'm here standing in this day and it's like, yes, there's some painful stuff in my family, but there's unfinished business that goes back even farther. God had already started a storyline of redemption earlier. You see what I'm saying? You got to go back a little bit further. And it's a storyline of revival and so abolition. Like all of our family lines, we have these things called generational blessings and generational curses that represent these dominating themes of storylines. And what God is shouting to America right now, right now is this. What storyline do we want to be a part of? The healing or the hurt? The blessing or the curse? What storyline want to be a part of? Last thing that connects us. Just to illustrate this so we understand it. You know, during the time of slavery, it was illegal for slaves to learn how to read and write. It was also illegal for anyone to teach them how to read and write. After slavery ended, it still wasn't popular. And so there in the Lockett Homestead area, it's 1867. And a former slave is trying to teach her young son how to read and write. But they're doing it in secret, like this legacy of the secret prayer meetings. Because they feared that if they were caught, there would be negative consequences. And so there's a mother trying to teach her young son how to read and write. And one night in walks Lucy Lockett, one of my family, and she caught them red-handed. But in that moment, Lucy chose a different storyline. She looks at the mother and she says, no, what you've chosen to do is very wise. And the reason we know the story in this much detail is because he wrote about it in his autobiography. Lucy began to tutor that young boy in how to read and write. He grew up, uh, his, his name was Robert Russell Moton. He grew up to replace Booker T. Washington as president of Tuskegee Institute. He was an educational advisor to presidents. And if you could put up the last image for me, please. In May of 1922, he gave the dedication speech of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, DC, where 41 years later, Dr. King would stand on that spot and declare, I have a dream. And exactly 41 years after that speech, Will and I would meet on the exact same spot. So think about it. This happened to two men who were led by dreams to meet each other at the Lincoln Memorial on MLK Celebration Day for a prayer meeting at the spot where Dr. King said, I have a dream that one day the sons of former slaves, the sons of former slave owners, will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. 
So maybe the dream speech wasn't poetry. Maybe it was prophecy. Maybe there's a dream king called the king of kings, and his father's still going to answer his son's prayer. Father, I pray that they be one so that your glory could come so that the world will believe. Maybe God had forgotten about the prayers of our mamas and our papas. Maybe there's still hope for healing our nation. God bless you guys. Hey, guys. Wow. Are you not floored? I'm telling you, we recorded Will Ford and Matt Lockett on our biblical justice class as well. If you have not gotten our biblical justice class that we released in uh, the summer, check that out because this story is amazing. Cameron. Yeah, I don't have words, to be honest, besides (laughs) like glory to God. I mean, I was, yeah, I was in awe. I truly, when I was done hearing that story, as I would think a lot of you are doing right now, just how great is our God? He, the fact that he had those details to the story intertwined before he even created the world. I mean, y'all think about that. Yes, before he knew those two people would meet on this and 10 years later discover that, you know, Matt's family owned I Will's mean, family. Like, I mean, really? Makes my heart like start pounding. Just the Lord is, he is so faithful. And you have, it encouraged me in my own walk with the Lord. I'm sure it encouraged you that we have like nothing to worry about. Um, there is so much that we could say um, Matt's faithfulness to to respond to the Lord and what he was speaking to him. And his dream and all of that is just one thing. Um, And so to see like how the Lord will use that simple obedience to do something that's literally so unthinkable. I mean, the, the home, the name, the, the fact they were friends for what a decade, a decade. I mean, I can't, I literally am speechless. Like it, and I'm, I love stories. And so when it makes me feel so small because I am so small and there's so much joy in being so small, like seeing the way the Lord writes these stories. He is the greatest author. He is the author and the finisher of your faith. He is the one who has written the whole story of life. And it's, it's all too, like there has been a, the never ending story of his goodness before even the story of life. Like you think about before Genesis one, the Lord was Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. And then after we go in, the, his people go into heaven, and after the end of, of this life on earth, that story is just going to continue. So he is the greatest storyteller, the greatest author, that he he's writing all these little individual stories on earth to point to the grand story of his glory. Yes. And so that above all else, that just made me say glory to God. Well, and I think it should give everybody hope that God's got your story. Yes, He's exactly. got your story. Uh, and Absolutely. if we just put our hope and our faith in him and, and again, partner with him in prayer, asking yes. him for his will in your story. Don't be afraid to so ask. So don't, don't be afraid to cry out mm. for your city or yes. cry out for your kids that are backsliding or, or cry out for healing. Yes. Um, he yes. hears those prayers and he That's knows right. the beginning from the end That's and right. he hears every prayer. Yes. Right. Amen. And so this story, I want you guys to share Matt and Will's story with people. Share this podcast with the other yeah. people because it is critical that we understand um, that we have to get over our offenses, bitterness, and unforgiveness. And and mm-hmm. that's what they demonstrated so clearly in their friendship. So check that out. Um, I appreciate you guys hanging out with us today. I know it's a busy fall, um, so we really honor um, that you get to hang out with Christians Engage. Take our pledge to pray, vote, and engage. Start praying, voting, and engaging regularly with us. And sign up for the 2023 Wake Up Conference. Yep. November 3rd and 4th, Cottonwood Creek, Allen, Texas. Come from all over the country. We would love to see you. It is going to be incredible. See all of yes. our government and ministry leaders that are going to be at that, including Cameron Green, oh, will be so speaking <laughs> at that conference. So we'll see you in November. Thank you so much for joining us for this incredible podcast. What in the time we've had. We love you so much. We love being in your life. Have you subscribed? Have you shared this with your family and friends? Please subscribe on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, Rumble, wherever you get your audio or video pods. We need your help. 
This mission is undergirded by individuals just like you that support this ministry monthly, annually, and whenever you think about us to be able to reach over a million Christians in the next two years. That's our goal. We want to empower a million Christians around America to pray, vote, and engage regularly. Will you help us? We're here to do that, and we need your help. I want to say thank you to our partners at The Stream. What an incredible online publication put out by James Robinson and Life Outreach International. As we come together across denominational lines as believers to discern what God's saying about the news of the day and to hear from different viewpoints. Check out the stream, make it your homepage, and get on their email list. This product is amazing. Also, our partners at Edify app, put out by Christian Post. This podcast app is a convergence of Bible teachers around America. We're excited to be a part of Edify app check out all their other podcasts. Thank you so much again for caring about this nation. We're here to help you pray, vote, and engage. We'll see you next week.